Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, tensor products and how we can think of them as conditional linear layers. The reason I'm dedicating a video on this is because so far I've been talking about this message passing framework where we want to condition the messages on attributes, on some quantities, that, such that these messages are really specific for that pair of, of mo uh, molecules or, or, or nodes that, that we're looking at. So this idea of conditioning uh, is important there. And in this video, I want to make precise what I mean with conditional linear layers and conditional MLPs. So the idea is that um, we work with this, uh, with this graph neural networks and we want to update node features based on message aggregations, where these messages are specific between pairs of nodes. We want them to be specific between pairs of nodes. And therefore we want to distinguish maybe also based on geometric notions that maybe one node is different than the other, for example. And if I'm an atom is sending uh, or is pulling towards another uh, atom from a certain direction relative to, let's say, carbon atoms, that maybe this could mean something and influences the total energy. So you want to incorporate such directional information in, in the networks. Uh, okay, so we want to have MLPs that are also depending or, let's say, conditioned on such attributes. And now we want this whole framework to be equivalent. So we're actually looking for functions that are equivalent, right? So if the input is predictably transformed via a representation of uh, SO3, then the output should also transform accordingly because this guarantees that no information is lost when the entire point cloud uh, were to uh, be rotated. Okay, so the idea is that these functions that we're typically after, we're going to parameterize them with multi-layer perceptrons, right? Because we know how to work with them. But they, uh, so let, let's just write it down. So the phi's are now multi-layer perceptrons. Let's make this explicit. Uh, but the problem now is that multi-layer perceptrons can only handle scalar-valued vectors. And I call them not just vectors, but vectors in which along the, the elements we have scalar values because we also looked at steerable vectors before. Now the idea is that a scalar transforms trivially, right? I cannot rotate a scalar value. So the representation, like the zero, or type zero representation of uh, SO3 is just the constant one. So it's just leaving uh, the scalar value invariant. And it also means that if I have some vector consisting of the scalar quantities, so directionless feature values, then the representation are really diagonal identity matrices. So what does it tell us? It tells us that whatever I provide to the MLP should tra trivially transform. So because the, whatever the, the output of this MLP is, it transforms trivially via this identity matrix. And therefore also whatever I put as input should not depend on these uh, rotations. And this also, if we want to make use of, let's say relative positions, then uh, and we want to embed that relative position into some attribute, then this should be an invariant embedding, meaning that if I rotate um, you know, the, this, uh, these positions, then the embedding vector should stay the same. And this would, for example, be the case with this uh, norm or you know, a relative distance-wise uh, uh, attribute embedding. Now, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to propose a solution where we actually are going to design multi-layer perceptrons, which take as input steerable vectors that transform uh, via some representation of the rotation group. Um, and we make these MLPs equivalent such that the output also transform predictably. So we, were, we really are going to design equivalent multi-layer perceptrons. And if we... Um, can, guarantee, can guarantee such equivalent mappings, then we're also allowed to use, um, well, edge attributes that transform via a non-trivial uh, representation. And this can, for example, be obtained by steerable functions. Now, if I embed this displacement vector in a steerable function, then I know that the output of this embedding transforms via some representation of the group SO3. So I can plug in here some representation of the S group SO3, and I can um, maintain equivalence throughout my neural networks by working with equivalent uh, MLPs. Okay, so the goal is uh, twofold actually. One is we want MLPs that are equivalent, and secondly, we want the MLPs to be conditioned in some sense on these attributes. So let's talk about this conditioning aspect. Well, what do I mean with it? So it means that the output of this MLP um, for some uh, input vector v depends on the attribute on which it is uh, conditioned. 
And we are already familiar with two types of conditioning, right? Quite often we see if you want to use some feature <coughs> in our computations, then we simply concatenate it to our feature vector. So we have sort of like the stacking on or concatenation type of conditioning, right? Now the output of this layer, which takes this input V also depends on the AIJ, but only in a, in a weak sense, right? Because this is a linear layer. So this matrix W could maybe be split into a W1 and a W2 part, such that this output is really a sum of W1 applied to V plus W2 applied to A I J. So it's it's a bit like an additive conditioning. So the output of a linear layer applied to V is augmented with, let's say, an adaptive bias that depends on this uh, uh, edge attribute. Okay, so stacking can be thought of as a form of uh, conditioning. But we also saw in the convolutional setting that our convolution kernels really are linear transformations that depend on a, a spatial position, on a relative offset, uh, right? So convolution kernels can be thought of as um, well, conditional linear layers, where the linear transformation of the neighbor feature is uh, conditioned on this relative uh, position. So what neighbor direction am I currently looking at? And what is classically being done is that these um, input dependent uh, linear transformations are expanded in basis function where the basis functions only depend on this uh, attribute part on uh, let's say relative position and we take linear combination of them which creates a matrix valued field and once you do that and that's i'm going to explain in, in the next slide we actually arrive at the idea that these layers are actually bilinear layers uh, taking uh, two inputs the vector v and our attribute or let's say the, the basis functions evaluated at these attribute uh, locations uh, on the left and V on the right, uh, respectively. And once we talk about bilinear layers, we actually talk about tensor products. So, uh, so here we have this tensor product form. And the purpose uh, of the next slide is to show that whenever we see such a, a weight parameterized tensor product, we should think maybe of conditional uh, linear layers. So let's make that clear in, in the next slide. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. We want to build conditional multilayer uh, perceptrons, and these multilayer perceptrons are uh, made up out of these linear layers, so matrix vector multiplica uh, multiplication alternated with activation functions, uh, for example, a ReLU. Um, so we're going to focus on this linear part, and we want to condition that on some attribute. So what does a linear layer look like? It's really a matrix vector multiplication, and in this case, uh, F is indeed a column vector, and I'm using L here as the row index of my matrix and uh, J as the column uh, index. Um, so really I'm just doing a lot of multiplications and sums here. And now the idea is that we want these weights to depend on our attribute, for example, our displacement vector, right? Because uh, if that is the geometric quantity, we want to, to use that in our uh, message passing framework. And I'm now using relative position as an attribute because that's what we're used to seeing when we talk about uh, convolutions, right? So now our conditional linear layer is still a matrix vector multiplication, but this matrix somehow depends on this uh, relative uh, position. So still, we still have the sum over these indices, uh, a multiplication. So for every output uh, element in my vector, I need to multiply over all um, you know, the columns in my matrix with all the rows in my vector. Okay, so what we're going to do next is expand this matrix valued function because this W is really a matrix valued function which takes for every relative position, it spits out a matrix, right? A matrix that is then being used in this matrix vector multiplication. So we're going to expand that in a particular basis. So suppose we have a basis that only depends on this Euclidean offset uh, vector, right? So a Y of X. It could be these circular harmonics that we've seen before, or at least spherical harmonics maybe in the 3D setting. Then these matrix valued functions expanded in this basis uh, look like this. So we have that this function is a linear sum of our basis function where each basis function gets assigned its own transformation matrix, right? And uh, that generates this continuous function on uh, the domain uh, R3. So for every basis function, we have this matrix. So we have this uh, subscript J, which indexes uh, the, the basis uh, functions. And then we again have the, the row and the column in this as uh, J and L. And maybe worth mentioning here is that these uh, basis functions evaluated at these coordinates uh, can also be called coordinate embeddings. Okay, so 
now that we have expanded our function in these uh, bases, let's just directly plug in this expression over here. What we get then actually is that the output feature f is obtained via a bilinear uh, layer. Because now we need to not only sum over, uh, let's say, the columns in this vector, but we also need to sum over the basis functions. And this bilinear layer is parameterized by the weights that correspond to the coefficients of my uh, matrix valued function relative to this basis. So you see that the evaluation of this conditional linear layer boils down to a bilinear layer where we take this tensor product with the feature vector f and the coordinate embedding indexed with j. So actually I should remove this j over here because that's part of the, uh, the summation uh, that you see over here. Okay, so what we see is that conditional li linear layers that are expanded in such a basis can be thought of as tensor product or maybe partially evaluated tensor products. Because a tensor product is a bilinear form, it takes a vector on the left, it takes a vector on the right, and then spits out a new vector or, or a scalar value. Anyway, it takes two inputs. But what if I already plug in one of the inputs, then it only takes one input, uh, there's one input left. So quite often we, this notation makes perfect sense. So W as a function of XB minus XA is like uh, this tensor product partially evaluated. So it'd be already summed over this J index and what it, what is left then is still a matrix. So we can still, then once we evaluated that, so it's partially evaluated this tensor product only this side we can still compute the output via this matrix vector multiplication, matrix uh, vector multiplication. And I think this is really important to realize because so far, most of us have been working with uh, linear layers with matrix vector multiplication, but not so much with uh, bilinear layers or tensor product. And I think it's important to realize that if you take a bilinear uh, layer of a feature vector with some coordinate embedding, let's say, then we're actually thinking about maybe uh, conditional linear layers. So we're going to use this idea now to build equivariant uh, multilayer perceptrons. And for that, we need to have a specialized uh, tensor product called the klebsch gordon tensor product. And this is a tensor product um, specialized for working with uh, steerable vectors in a, in a convenient way. So that will be the topic of uh, the next video.